following clip contains a key metaphor for the analysis conducted during this video. It also contains major spoilers for Season 3 of Cobra Kai. Anyone who has seen this marvel of a series, containing the perfect blend of action, romance, comedy, redemption and heart, please continue watching. For those uncultured heathens who haven't, please skip to 220 to save it for yourself. Enjoy. What did you do? Waited a long time for this. Chosen. No. Yeah. Honk. <laughs> I'm glad you're having fun at my expense. Oh, you should have seen your face. <laughs> what technique was that? My limbs were totally numb. Secret of Miyagi pressure points. If an enemy insists on war, then you take away their ability to wage it. Eh? Can you teach me? <clears throat> chills. Actual chills. But enough about that, we're here to talk today about the Wallabies, Dave Rennie, and what exactly has happened over the past year or two. What is clear about the recent wins over South Africa is that the Wallabies are very, very fond of conducting their homework. They have done a lot of study, which ironically is quite different to the Cheka era where it really wasn't high on the priority list. SWOT analysis, or strength, weaknesses, opportunities and threats, has been used in rugby for years. One of the first pioneers of this was Rob McQueen, the Australian Wallabies coach who won the World Cup in 1999 and who basically analysed the opposition to a near finite degree. Analysis of a team, however, would only take you so far. McQueen was very fond of referencing Sun Tzu and using Sun Tzu principles in the regards to the running of his team. An adherence to these principles, along with innovations that he made at the Brumbies, led to the Wallabies being the most successful team of the late 90s, early 2000s. The reason I'm bringing this up, however, is there's something I want to show you that kind of correlates to the modern day Wallabies and what they're currently doing. Was the Brumbies connection a major issue? It was certainly an issue. I think that we've been used to uh, having a lot of player power. I'd certainly uh, have always endorsed that as I went along. And probably um, I didn't realise that Queensland and New South Wales to an extent hadn't been used to that style of coaching and so it worked out more by accident that the, the Brumbies were having a lot more input into things because they were used to having it wasn't their fault. Um, but it was probably my fault for not realising early that uh, I had to encourage the New South Wales and the Queensland players to also have an input and had to have a more balanced input across the borders to, to an, uh, I suppose, an Australian way of doing things. In August, I put out a poll asking for the next Wibble video. Now, I'm sorry I am going to do this, it's just September was a really, really difficult month for me. However, people may have been surprised to see the Wallabies growth even in there. It wasn't just the evolution of the Wallaby game plan, but it's an evolution of the way that they're running things and the culture they're developing. Rennie is a master of developing the culture, as has been shown by his time at the Chiefs. They won two back-to-back -back Super Rugby titles, and they had, you know, joint handshakes. They just had a really feel-good culture about them in the way that they were doing things in the environment. And this is something that the Wallabies are really showing now. They, they really act like a kind of big brother, little brother type act here. And it's not just in this direction that it feels like it's kind of changed from the Checker era. But on top of that, what we're seeing here, in particular here, is players actually running in the analysis in the halftime talk. Now, this is something that Graham Henry and Rob McQueen 
were very, very prevalent on. In my last year of study, I had to read a lot of papers and none affected me more than this one. Now, this is a case study based on the turning points after 2004 and 2007 in the running of the All Black team and how they did things. Now, as we can see here, I actually highlighted this because I used it in many, many papers. The formation of a dual management model, as in the players actually helping run the team and organizing the way of things done. You know, this is very, very important to the way that the All Blacks ran their team. But then if we go down a little bit further, you know, carry on, carry on. The next one is this transformational leadership. These changes, these cultural changes set the All Blacks on the path that led them to two World Cups and nearly a decade of unrivaled dominance being called the best team ever. Transformational leadership was a key part of this, and it was also found in the 2003 England team. Now TFL, or transformational leadership, is known as the four I's that constitute it, which is idealized influence, inspirational vision, individualized consideration, and also intellectual stimulation. Now idealized influence is where the players want to follow a player's or a coach's example. They don't need to out of like, you know, a hierarchical principle, but they want to because of admiration and a role model set. Now what on top of that, you set the vision or a goal for them to achieve and then you provide each of them with tailored support. Each player gets tailored support as to how they're going to achieve it. Lastly, if this wasn't enough, intellectual stimulation means the players are expected to input and solve problems whilst helping develop the game plan. This develops the ultimate buy-in as players are likely to fight for something that they've helped develop. Rather than just being provided by the coaches, they have a vested interest in it succeeding because it's theirs. Ultimately, TFL is designed to develop a team of leaders. It forms a team of thinking players who all understand the game plan and it's not just done by the coaches. Everything, the attack and the defense is not run by the coaches, it has player input. On a side note, the best team I've seen with this mindset in the last year weren't a rugby team, they were a netball team. We turned up to film their practice one day and the coaches weren't there yet. Yet the team had already ran their warm up, scheduled the session and they were coaching themselves and thinking of ways to beat their opposition that weekend based on analysis that they had actually conducted in their own time. And on top of that, it was all centered around a senior leadership group. This is in the senior leadership group had actually assigned players certain areas of the game to analyze. That is how in depth this went. And I have never seen this in rugby. I've never seen it in rugby yet. It was here in netball, which was far more professional than I really realized. The All Blacks have been doing this for years. Now, England have also been doing it for a while. And as we can see here, Quade Cooper and Nick Wire are actually running the analysis and the attack. Now, Scott Wisemantle is obviously the attack coach. He's here and he's, you know, overseeing it. But it's player input. The players are actually coming up with ideas and thinking, how can we attack? How can we isolate? And obviously, this is something we're going to show you today. So we're going to show you how they did it. But it's just really good to see this approach coming into the Wallabies. This level of analysis is key to playmakers like Quade Cooper and Nick White. This article by Codex Analysis shows Danny Cipriani's management and his process. And as we can see, the level of detail on positional opportunities, like, you know, whether they drift too early, whether they man watch, that's the depth we're talking about here. The Wallabies needed every inch of homework that they could get on the Springboks, because in order to do what they needed to do to beat the Springboks twice, a World Cup winning champion side twice, they needed to go to this level of detail. There were certain players who were targeted, and they weren't targeted because they were weak tacklers, they were targeted because of their roles in the defensive system. But what we really want to show you today are the system areas that Rennie and Wiseman were targeted with their ever-increasingly street smart and ever-improving Wallabies side. You see, under Rennie, the Wallabies are becoming considerably more pragmatic. They're becoming more balanced. They're not running the ball out of the 22 like they tried to in the 2019 World Cup. Instead, they're playing field position territory and just playing a little bit smarter. Them. I think they're a well-balanced side in terms of, um, especially when they, they, they started, uh, they've got a, a, a bigger focus, I would say, on, on exiting and, and not overplaying. I think against New Zealand, they maybe did overplay. I think they had three or four uh, intercept tries. Uh, where I, I, I thought they played um, a lot more territory. Um, yeah, no, they were, they were brilliant. They were brilliant tonight. See, Dan McKellar and Scott Wisemental in particular have done a really good job with this Wallaby side. Now, it's not just the fact that, you know, it's not like they're a bad side, the Wallabies. They were never a bad side. They've created some epic opportunities. And against the All Blacks, they really played some really great rugby. You know, great catch and pass, great skills. It looks really good. However, there may have been some areas where, you know, it, you know, it just went a little bit too wrong for them. 
coach for showing me the way to make light of any given game situation. However, this wouldn't have annoyed Rennie that much. It, it really wouldn't. What would have annoyed him was the effort that the Wallaby players put in, particularly during the Bledisloe Cup series, especially when the All Blacks made a break. You see, the Wallabies created a lot during this series. They played some great rugby and created an awful lot of opportunities, yet when the All Blacks make a break here, they outrace the retreating Wallabies line with absolute ease. The desperation to make that cover tackle once the All Blacks are through the line is really kind of non-existent except for Tate McDermott who gives it 100% all the way. And it's not the only time that we see this. The All Blacks regularly outrace the retreating Wallabies line, which led to tries which, with a bit more desperation from the Wallabies, would have been stopped. I mean, this, what we're about to see here, is a prime example. Aaron Smith makes the break, but as we can see here on his left, Cody Taylor outraces Alatoa, Swinton and Swain to actually outrace them and make the try. And the only one really with him at the end is Michael Hooper, who of course, absolute legend, gives everything every time. This was a problem against the All Blacks, yet against the Springboks, the Wallabies were a different team. They were on a different level of intensity. Everything changed, something clicked, and I don't know what it was, but... You know, the Wallabies went absolutely through the roof and the Springboks weren't up to their usual standards, which kind of was the reason behind the results that we got. I mean, the Box have an insane pack. They have a brilliant defence, a brilliant kicking game. And on top of that, it's so well drilled, so well organised. They know the way they want to play. Yet against the Wallabies, they changed it up a bit. I don't know if it was in a response to this criticism that's becoming out of the New Zealand media, the British media, all the media around the world, you know, which is basically jealousy. But... Against the Wallabies, they did drop off. Now, it could be quarantine, it could be the really hard away from home conditions, I don't know, but they did concede four tries. Now, the box do not concede four tries in the game. It, it just doesn't happen to this defence. Simply put, I think the box are still getting used to this evolution of their game. You see, the box are an absolutely exceptional team and they're so much more than just a dominant pack and a brilliant defence and a brilliant kicker. I mean, they have exceptional playmakers and X-Factor outside backs and they're evolving their game to unleash these guys more, to bring them into the game more. The kicker is that their fitness to play this game needs to adapt to be able to match this ambition. Against the Wallabies, you know, it was pretty early in the season, it may not have been there, but two weeks later they combined their kicking game with a much more rounded and balanced ball in hand attack to beat the All Blacks and they painted different pictures, not just the one. Against the Wallabies, you're always going to get teething problems when you first try to evolve your game, and the fitness may not have been there, which is why you saw mistakes like this. What we saw against the All Blacks in that second test and against the Wallabies was night and day, in terms of just their familiarity and the ability also to keep up with that ball in hand attack, it, there, it was night and day in terms of intensity and execution, and that's why I think fitness may have had a little bit of something to do with it. However. We are here to talk about the Wallaby game plan, not all about the box, and this was the Wallaby game plan to beat the spring box. They wanted to target the D4 gap, they wanted to defuse the box kicking game, and they also wanted to play in the right areas of the field. Now, part and parcel, a large part of this, was down to Wisemantle. The Wallabies are starting to front up a lot more. They're not always picking those sly second line options. They're actually going through the phases off nine a lot more just to truck it up and waiting with patience until they get their shot. It's far more pragmatic, and when they do release the trigger and go wide, they're doing it at the right time with the right reasons. Now, today is not a full-blown breakdown of the Wallaby attack or defence, much like you saw in the England attack game plan or the South African Lions series. What you will be looking at is the pressure points. That's what we're finding out today. Those points that, if targeted correctly and with force, can accurately open an opponent up and leave them defeated. That is what we're looking at today. Now, it's a long one again, so grab a cup of tea, sit back, and hopefully... Enjoy it. The simplest question we're going to answer is the most important one. How does Scott Wisemantle, former England attack coach and current Wallabies attack coach, beat Jacques Ninaba's World Cup winning defence that has conquered nearly all before it? If you've seen the previous videos on the Springbok defence, you'll know this, but it literally covers 
all options. It covers like it's got backups to backups to backups of the unlikeliest chance that someone can get through. Wise Mental, however, got through this. The tactics for the Wallabies were to target the bodyguards, to isolate forwards at the tackler catch-up gap, to play deep to bait the adjusting defenders, and lastly, to front up in their carries. Now, if you've ever watched my videos before, you'll know that Vermeulen's role is very important to the way the Springboks defend. Basically, Vermeulen fills in at guard, and he's one of the main defensive captains of South Africa, being able to watch from the ruck and organise the defensive line as to result to 21 or 31 pounds. Putting him here means he doesn't have to make that many tackles. He has the best vantage point as he's right in the ruck to look at the attack and therefore he can work out what the attack are going to do and organise his line accordingly. Now by extension, if you can take him out here, you can probably disorganise the rest of the defensive line, you know? Like take out one of their key decision makers, therefore affect the decision making of the defence. Well, Australia fought that too. All throughout the two games, the Wallabies just really tried to piss Vermeulen off. You know, they tried to literally stop him organising or having any say in what the defence did at all. Now, of course, they didn't succeed 100%. That would be kind of impossible. But you can see that they're trying to occupy his attention. You know, they're doing pick and goes. They're going beyond the ball just to try. And, you know, like, as you can see here, they're just trying to stop him from doing his job. You know, they're just trying to distract him. That's all that they're trying to do. But they, they only have to distract him. That's all that they have to do. What we just showed you here may seem fairly innocuous, you know, it's just them going a little bit beyond the try and tie in Vermeulen. But if we have a look and see what it results in, you know, you wouldn't be so sure. The Wallabies targeted him here constantly to compromise the pillar defence and to affect the decision making of the defensive line for the next phases. In example one, Valentini goes up and makes good gain line and Tate McDermott scoots to target Vermeulen. Now what happens here is important. Kitsoff jams in to free up Vermeulen so he doesn't have to make the tackle, but this takes him out of the defensive line. Now, Vermeulen needs to move here, as you're about to see, via the system. He has to fold round the ruck, but he can't do that because the Wallabies often run switch patterns off third phase, meaning he has to stay here and guard it. This is a common Bok defensive principle. The guard on one side of the ruck will fold around the ruck to fill the gap as the attack moves wide. Now, as Kitsoff is taken out the line, Vermeulen can't fold as he's holding for the potential switch play. This means that he can't fold round and the gap is open for the inside step to Hooper to stake it straight up the guts. Not to mention that this really results in a great break for Australia, but in example two, we see Rodder go beyond the ruck and tie up Vermeulen, which opens the gap for the inside option in Banks. Now, this is a planned move, and if were it not for Faf de Klerk's proactive fold, this is a try. The reason this is so smart is that Australia were targeting system. They were not targeting individual flaws, they were targeting system flaws, and therefore, inadvertently, this try was wonderful. Karevi takes out the 10-12 channel targeting Dialende and trying to stop his reload. Now, the 9, Tate McDermott, then scoots, again targeting Dwayne Vermeulen and the 3 in Vincent Cock. Now, these guys are very important to the way that the Springbok defence organise. They organise the defence of set piece. Because they're off their feet, they can't organise the defence, and as such, we have an error here. Fafter Clerk and Malcolm Marks folding around to the open side of the ruck. Now, Etzebeth is actually calling this, so it's not all their fault, but he is not in the best position to view the short side. He cannot see the short side danger like 8 and 3 would when they're positioned at the ruck, and therefore, they've folded too many men over and the short side is short. As such, all it takes from Hooper is a simple mispass to get outside the Springbok defence, go down the line with an epic offload from Tupo, and score a try. Now this is a direct result of the Wallabies taking out the Springbok defensive captains. Vermeulen's the only man to come back into the short side, and even though he corner flags to try and catch the attack, Corabelli is just too quick for him. However, sometimes you just have to, you just have to appreciate great play, and that was great play. Now, the next way that the Wallabies targeted the Springboks in attack was via isolating the catch-up defender. Now, they either isolated a forward at catch-up or they blocked him. Now, this bit may be a little bit confusing if you haven't seen any prior videos on Springbok defence or just the dynamics and the way that it works. However, we're going to go through it in a little bit of detail just so you get a basic understanding if you haven't seen it so you can keep up and understand what's going on. So, in green at the second defender, we have Khaleesi at catch-up defender. In blue, we have Dialande at tackler, and then outside him, Am and Mapimpi are as adjusting defenders who close down the second line. Now, Khaleesi pushes out Dialande so that the adjusting defenders can blitz as their inside is covered via Dialande. The Wallabies' plan was to cause separation and target this gap, and they wanted to target it all game with their best attackers. You see, when Khaleesi in green caught up to Dialende, he in turn makes Dialende the catch-up defender, meaning Dialende has to catch up to Am on the outside. 
Now, the way that the Wallabies targeted this is they wanted to target the two edge to isolate a forward a catch up defender. They wanted to obstruct the catch up defender with blocker plays, and lastly, they wanted to play their second receivers deep to bait the adjusting defenders forward and open the gap. Let's show you this in greater detail. In red, we have Creel and Yantyi highlighted as the adjusting defenders, and on the inside, we have Pollard as the catch up defender. Now, the adjusting defenders are trying to blitz and shut down the first and second receiver. Now, if there's an inside step by McKenzie here, the catch-up defender, or Pollard, is meant to catch up and tackle McKenzie to snuff it out. It's key that he gets over in time, as if he doesn't, there is a natural gap that forms from the adjusting defender blitz, and therefore this gap is vulnerable to the inside step, which is why if you have a back at this position, they can get over quicker and cover it far more easier. To open this gap, they wanted to either block the catch-up defender and therefore check his drift, to isolate a forward catch-up defender so he can get over in time, and lastly, play their second receiver deep so the adjusting defenders are forced to come forward a lot and open that gap. Now, we know that Wiseman Tool is very fond of league-style blocker plays. I mean, we can even see a video on YouTube with the time blocker play. You know, it's kind of self-explanatory. But what the other option is, is the 3-2 split. Now, if you've watched the previous videos, you'll understand this, but the backs are split in the defensive system of South Africa on the edges in either a 3 or a 2. Now, if you isolate and target the two edge, as you can see on the inside of the clerk here, we have Etzebeth, a forward at catch up defender. The principle is if the forward can't catch up quick enough, well, this gap is there to take. Now, as we can see here, we've got the free edge on this side with Diolande, Am, and Mapimpi. Now, it gets taken out quite easily, but as we look, when they target the two edge, Ozzy send Karevi directly at this gap between the catch up defender in Mostert and Faf de Klerk in the first adjusting defender. On top of this, Samu attempts to block Mostert, which is why Mostert doesn't release Faf de Klerk at adjusting defender to blitz, because he's worried that he won't be able to get over and block this gap. You see, Faf de Klerk, as the initial adjusting defender, won't blitz if Mostert doesn't release him with a jam call. Now, if he does jam forward, that's because Mostert has released him. However, if there is really serious danger, the adjusting defenders will back themselves and blitz forward to shut down the options. This is where the Wallabies were banking on the catch-up defender being too slow or being blocked to make the tackle on the inside. Wales were really the only team in the 2019 World Cup to realise the value of this target, except they make an error on first phase in that they target Diolende. This allows him the option to reload short side, and on second phase they do the right thing and take from Ulan, but they don't get rid of Cock, who takes over as defensive captain. Now because Diolende is slotted in at catch-up on the short side, however, he is fast enough to take halfpenny, with Faf congratulating him here. If they hadn't hit Diolende, they would have isolated Kits off at the catch-up defender, and therefore they probably could have got past him because he wouldn't have been quick enough to get over, unlike Diolende. Diolende is very experienced at defending this gap. We can see his proactivity here in catching up to make sure an inside step by Japan would not work. He's very experienced at defending this area. This is why Wisemantle made sure that his Wallabies were targeting this area, either under blocker conditions or with a forward at catch-up, and they did it with their best carriers in Marigi Kokorobedi and Samu Karevi, the two best carriers that Australia have in post-contact. Kaa two targets Von Staden at blocker, with Nkosi jamming in, yet this is a defensive variation as Faf has held its depth. Nonetheless, Karevi takes an inside step and offloads through the gap, which eventually leads to a break. Even though Faf holds his depth, they still target this gap with the pass, and it's very unlucky that Australia don't get a try here. The point is that we can see the inside step of Karevi. He's taken the ball deep, and therefore that gives him time to make that inside step, to target this gap, to hopefully make a break himself, or if he can't, pass through it. And it's not the only thing. This isn't luck. This isn't the only time we see it. This is by design. Here we see the clerk leading the blitz on Cooper, which opens the gap. Now Karevi steps inside and Kosi, passing through this before he even sees his support. This proves that the Wallabies were targeting this gap. Another example was on a 31 pan, which is basically three phases one way followed by one phase off 10 the other. Now Callaway is going to get the ball, and he wants to target the gap between the adjusting defenders and the catch-up defender in Kitsoff. So that's the gap between Kitsoff and Mostert. Now he takes an inside step as Mostert rushes up. Now he doesn't quite get it, but you can see he's trying to target this gap or potentially pass through it, the same as Karevi. However, if you want a real Muttley moment, you know, where you kind of snigger after, have a look here. Now look very carefully at Slipper. He actually trips Moster as he's coming through, which results in this trip because he knows Callaway has a better chance of getting through if Moster is on the floor. Now thus far, whilst we've shown you these plays, you'd be right in thinking that we haven't really shown you any scoring opportunities that came out of them. However, there are some. We have got some. I am 64.3% positive that 
this gap came up in this conversation. Now the first variation we're going to show you is the blocker option. So you know where the catch up is actually blocked, you know, so the gap is opened. So if we have a look here, this is the first test. So we start from a midfield ruck. Now we've got Am at catch up defender and then at adjusting defender we have De Klerk and Mapimpi. So we are targeting, the Wallabies are targeting this gap. So let's have a look and see how it plays out. So the ball goes to Cooper who passes to Karevi. Now look what happens. Karevi takes an inside step targeting this gap and going inside the clerk. He makes the break and gets the ball to Kellaway, who has an absolutely great feel and a great way to find the line at the moment and goes over for the try. Now, Am's position here is inherently compromised by Etzebeth, but we can see the gap between the catch-up defender in Am and Faf de Klerk as the first adjusting defender, and that is what the Wallabies were trying to target with this blocker line from the two-pod. Even though the outside option in the two pod here doesn't make contact with Am, he is there to try and block his drift and open the gap for Karevi on the inside. Now, the Wallabies were actually so successful at this, they actually influenced the All Blacks. In a free face strike move, the All Blacks run a 10 12 crash option, followed by Weber running a Gregan style inside pass intended to tie up Vermeulen, much like McDermott's scoop for the Wallabies. After which, on third phase, they send one of their best runners at the catch up adjusting defender gap, with Barrett trying the same inside step and a blocker to try and stop Etzebeth. Now, it didn't work as there were a couple of little tiny things that were off, but as we can see, Fozzie took the same framework and the same template from the Wallabies because it was effective. Now, next up, we're going to look at the two edge strike option. So, this is where you've isolated a forward at catch up defender and the two adjusting defenders outside him. Now, in this case, this try was scored because Corabetti actually made his line to get around Vermeulen and get the offload away. Tupo makes a great carry here, which ties in Mapimpi, but then the Wallabies react with speed. They pass to Cooper. Cooper in turn passes to Kellaway, who gets the inside pass off to Corabelli off his wing. Corabelli gets the offload off to Ikitawa, who goes over for an easy run-in. Corabelli's line outraces Vermeulen's catch-up, which in turn allows him to get the offload away. As we can see here, it's a perfect two-edge strike. We can see the gap here between Vermeulen and Pollard. Pollard rushes up due to Kellaway's depth, which opens the gap, in turn forcing Vermeulen into his catch-up. However, Corabetti's line is almost lateral, meaning he gets outside Vermeulen, allowing him to pass through the gap to Ikatao. This is all possible because Corabetti runs laterally, and they isolated a forward at catch-up who couldn't catch Corabetti in time. That is essentially what it is, but it also stresses the work rate that the Wallabies are now going under, in which they reload their wingers over to the other side of the field to add an extra man in and to get breaks like this. Though Wisemantle has actually left England, we still see his philosophies in action with them. We can see the reload of multiple players from one side of the field to the other within one phase to add extra options. Whilst England did this under Amor, it didn't originate with him. Wisemantle implemented this with the 10, 12, 15, England's passing options moving from one side of the field to the other dependent on when they wanted to strike. It was really all about using Australia's best carriers as often as possible to get into this gap under the best circumstances where they were likeliest to make a break, and this was done with enhanced work rate, targeting the weakest points of the South African line, and it worked very effectively. Now this was the first step of how the Wallabies wanted to target the box. Next was defusing the kicking game, which, time to show you now. You know, we, um, look, we want to play, um, but we're also planning as a side that doesn't want the ball. So we talked a lot about giving them the ball, and, and ideally in situations where when they kick, we can profit off it. So, you know, we still, we still didn't do a good enough job around um, the high ball, and, uh, and that's got to be better. Now, whilst the box are undergoing an evolution, their main DNA, their main style of play is a kicking defensive orientated game. Now they are trying to expand this obviously because they need to be able to play when the space is available on the line and therefore this is why we started to see this style of play. There is nothing wrong with employing the kicking game. It's a winning style of play, it's won the box so many games and it kind of generates memes like this which does make me chuckle a little bit. When it comes down to it, the Bok kicking game is a very, very, very powerful weapon and if you have something like this in your arsenal, of course you're going to use it. If the space is in the backfield, particularly with the 50-22, it's just more efficient to kick to this area. However, you can't do it all the time and that's why the boxers are evolving their game to attack the areas in the line that have space. The kicking game of the spring box, the bomb squad, is essentially a very powerful weapon and as such, defusing it was quite an important task for Rennie to focus on. 
However, the Wallabies didn't just want to defuse the bot kicking game, they wanted to prosper off it, which is why it was designed to put the Wallaby back free and their best carries into favourable counter-attack positions. This began with the attempt to nullify the box exit strategy. Now, exit strategy is as it says it is. It's basically a team's strategy to get the ball out of their own 22. The Wallabies went after this, as it's a major territorial weapon for the box. The box exit strategy follows a few key principles. Now, essentially, we're just going to let you watch through this just again. But as we see here, Vermeulen takes it, the ball is recycled, and then Faf de Klerk puts in an incredibly accurate box kick, which eventually is actually reclaimed by the box. Now, this is exactly what the Wallabies wanted to stop. They wanted to stop the box getting easy meters, which is basically what this is. The Wallabies' plan to defuse these kicks was based around adjusting lines and player assignment to each of the individual players involved in the South African exit strategy. We can see the Aussie template in this kick. Now the kick goes up and Vimulin takes it. Now here we can see highlighted in red, James Slipper. Now look very carefully, Isaac Rodder comes in and pushes him out one position down the line. Now this is seems quite innocuous, but no, it's very important because he has a key role in blocking the exit strategy. The kick goes up and immediately Slipper's role in disrupting the South African exit strategy becomes clear. His role is to obstruct Etzebeth, located here on the far right in the red ring. And on the other side, we have Khaleesi and Nkosi, who are covered by Korobedi and Karevi, as we'll see shortly. But these are the three main chasers behind the South African exit strategy. These are the guys that are going after the ball. Nkosi's role was at catcher, with Khaleesi and Etzebeth there to secure him and prevent opposition counter-rocking. Now the Wallabies assigned obstructors to each of the South African chasers. Slipper for Etzebeth, Karevi for Khaleesi, and Korobedi for Nkosi. Their positioning at the start of the kick is absolutely key. We can see this here with Rodder grabbing Slipper and putting him into the correct position to make sure he's ready to obstruct Etzebeth's line. Now Slipper does his job here, but he does it a little bit too aggressively and right in front of Matt Carley, meaning that, you know, Etzebeth goes down and it's quite an easy, blatant penalty. But what they're trying to do, as we can see, is just alter their lines to affect the chaser. Slipper has Etzebeth, but Karevi and Korobedi take Khaleesi and Nkosi. Now this is kind of a little bit of an escort policy. Officially, it's called a net by a few premiership teams. But as we can see here in this exit, again, we got Slipper, who's going to take Etzebeth. At the bottom of the screen here, we got Karevi and Korobedi. And they both organise themselves so they can block Unkosi and Khaleesi as best they can. Now, there is another reason why Rennie wants Korobedi and Karevi as part of the net. You see, when the counter comes, he wants them near the ball carrier. Now, this is pretty obvious probably as to why this is, because they're two of Australia's best carriers, and it's quite clear why the Wallabies want them here. Coro Betty, in particular, is absolutely lethal on the counter-attack. Now, imagine if you have Banks going in and offloading to Coro Betty, and he gets to start doing this stuff against a broken field defence. You know, it is a natural progression to what Australia want to do. They want him on the end of moves, taking these offloads and making breaks. This is all part of Rennie's policy to profit off the Springbok kicking game, and it's all based around the fact that they want to get their counter-attackers into the game. Now, the Wallaby net had three main principles it needed to execute. Forming depth, changing line, and providing counter options. These were the three things the Wallabies wanted to do to nullify the bot kicking game. By forming depth, we mean getting a decent enough distance between the catcher and the eventual Springbok chasing line. As we can see here, Quay Cooper gets on the offensive, but we have Karevi on his shoulder because Karevi as part of the net has come back to try and provide counter attacking options. It's a very common thing. We see Callaway here changing his line to obstruct and hopefully stop the Springboks actually reaching the catcher. Here, we have Valentini who slows his retreat so he blocks Pollard and allows Pattaya the time to take the ball and get into a position that he is going to be secured. Now, the Wallabies did not execute these principles as well as Dave Rennie wanted, but we can see them all throughout the chase process. Sometimes you can't control it. You can't control how well Faf de Klerk kicks because that overrules everything. But we can see what the Wallabies are trying to do. On top of that, they're going for more pragmatic kicking. Again, they're trying to play in the right areas of the field. This seems such a simple thing as we've seen so many teams doing it and indeed a lot of journalists are crying out against this, saying you can't do this, you'll ruin the game of rugby. However, you need to play in the right areas of the field. South Africa do it, New Zealand do it, England do it and Australia are now doing it. It's smart kicking play. The wingers of opposition teams are now hugging the touchlines to stop the 50-22, so the Wallabies are kicking down the middle to find grass. However, if they move to defend this area, the 50-22 kick coupled with a good chase is going to cause problems for the opposition, as we can see. In the end, though, the reason that this was such a big win for the Wallabies is because the Wallabies needed a big win. Australia needed an injection of life into their game. It was something that was needed. I mean, let's think about it. 
The last period of sustained success at the top of the table for the Wallabies had come in 2001. Its crazy loan popularity, their sponsors Qantas had flown away, and to turn it around they needed a big fish. Enter the Nelson Mandela Plate and beating the world champions twice on the bounce. The impact of landing a big fish on the confidence of a team can't be overstated. In 2018, the Springboks got their big fish by beating New Zealand in New Zealand. This gave them confidence in what they were doing. It showed that what they were doing with Rossi and Jacques was right. And this eventually paved the way to the World Cup because they knew what they were doing had put them on the right track. This win, these two wins against the Springboks, is exactly what this is for Australia. The Wallabies needed an injection of adrenaline, an injection of hope, because even though internally they knew what they were doing was the right thing, they needed to see the results, and the results builds that confidence. It builds the confidence in the public, in the team, in the coaching staff. I mean, look what it means to them. Just this win meant everything. Now, the Wallabies are not the finished product. To say that would be crazy, but it at least shows that under Rennie, they're on the right track to getting where they want to get to, which is eventually winning the Bledisloe Cup. I think that is the final hurdle for the Wallabies. If they can win the Bledisloe Cup, anything is possible. The team will be ready, and that means entertaining a notion that hasn't been thought of of years, winning the World Cup in 2023 or 2027. Australia is needed. World rugby needs a strong Australian side. And now... It's looking pretty good for the future.